Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, the podcast where we dig into the back catalog to select a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor, and alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. What's up, guys? Uh, the video version of today's episode is available on YouTube. If you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. How you doing today, Todd? I'm, How you feeling? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Uh, not too bad. So ready to jump into this? Let's do this, man. This week, we have 2014's The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 and 2015's The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2. Following her rescue from the devastating Quarter Quail, Katniss awakes in the complex beneath the supposedly destroyed District 13. Her home, District 12, has been reduced to rubble, and Peter Malark is now the brainwashed captive of President Snow. At the same time, Katniss also learns about a secret rebellion spreading throughout all of Panem, a rebellion that will place her at the center of a plot to turn the tables on Snow. The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 was released on November 21, 2014. On a budget of $125 million, it made $755 million. Okay. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 70% and an audience score of 71%. The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 was released on November 20, 2015. On a budget of $160 million, it made $659 million. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 70% and an audience score of 66%. So, Todd, let's discuss these films. Spoilers are ahead. So, Todd, last week we said that Catching Fire was the Empire Strikes Back of this series. So what is uh, Mockingjay Part 1? It would definitely probably be the Return of the Jedi, uh, maybe even a touch worse. (laughs) (laughs) Not worse as far as it being a bad film, but uh, you kind of wonder after watching if it was necessarily maybe deserving of an entire two-hour movie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I I agree with that. That's, That's probably the biggest issue with this film is that it shouldn't have been, the last film shouldn't have been split uh, split into two parts at all. Right. It should have been a, a tacked on 30 minutes into a bigger film, which we'll get into. Uh, but walk us through the opening of uh, Mock and Jay Part 1, Todd. So we uh, pick up with Katniss and her friends and family. Uh, they're back in District 13. They're in an underground facility. Uh, we learn it's the base of operations for the rebellion. Uh, we're introduced to uh, President Coyne. Uh, she's the leader of the movement. Uh, she informs Katniss that her actions in the last games have sparked riots and revolts throughout several districts. She actually wants Katniss to actually become the Mockingjay and be the symbol that unites and fires up the rebellion. Uh, she's reluctant at first, Katniss is, but she kind of agrees after she sees what's happened to Pete in the capital. Uh, he's basically become a puppet controlled by snow uh, that's been turned against her. Yeah. And that's it. That's the film. That's the Hunger Games. Good night, everybody. Uh, that's, the, that's the Hunger Games wheel spinning part one. That's what we'll call this film. Um, I mean, because that's what it is. Uh, but l- let's talk about some of the uh, the new cast additions for this film. So we, uh, as you talked about, we have President Al McCoy, uh, Julianne Moore, uh, Commander Paler, uh, Bettina Miller. Uh, we have Boggs played uh, by her Mashallah Ali. Uh, we have. Uh, Basically, Katniss's camera crew. Uh, yeah. We have Cressida, uh, which is Natalie Dormer. Uh, Pollux, uh, played by Foggy Nelson. <laughs> or uh, Fulton Reed, half of the Bash Brothers, depending <laughs> on your age there. Uh, his name is actually Eldon Henson. Uh, Caster, we have played by uh, West, uh, Wes Chatham. Uh, he's Pollux's brother. And we have Masala, played by Evan Ross. So basically, this is the... Uh, Basically, the, the the crew or the the basically the squad that kind of makes up uh, the, the new additions, and then the camera crew uh, that kind of follow Katniss around as the Mockingjay. Um, so basically, from where you're kind of leaving off, Katniss kind of visits the ruins of District Twelve at the end of it was it Catching Fire. We learn that District Twelve has basically been obliterated and wiped off the map by the Capitol. So she goes to visit the ruins of District Twelve. Uh, her old house is somehow untouched uh, by all this. I guess Victor's Village is far enough outside of the city limits that uh, didn't get didn't get hit. Right. Um, and it's I guess it's it's kind of littered with uh, those white roses that President Snow is kind of famous He's for. So at this fond point. of those. Yeah. Uh, something I didn't know that I that I looked up that I found interesting uh, about what the districts uh, are and what their their products are. So uh, I don't think it's really explained in the film. So District One is luxury items. District Two is masonry and defense. 
District th uh, District three is general electronics. District four fishing. Uh, five is power electricity. Six is transportation. Seven is lumber. Eight is textiles. Nine is grain. Ten is livestock. Uh, Eleven is agriculture. Do you remember what twelve is? Uh, it's okay. it's kind of set up of what they all are. Is it uh, farmers? No, bakery. Coal, coal, bake, coal, coal miners. <laughs> bakery. <laughs> bake. Do they bake, Cody? <laughs> no. Well, Peter baked all that bread. Peter did, but no, they're 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 coal. Ard artichokes. Artichoke. Odd vox. <laughs> Uh, they're, uh, they, they, they produce coal or, or, uh, that's right. The coal, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Coal miners. Okay. Um, so, uh, Katniss, she meets her new film team. Uh, she's given, uh, Effie Trinket back. We see her underground in the district 13 bunker stripped of all her makeup and her wigs. Of course. Um, she, she's back as basically as Katniss's stylist, close friend, uh, Gail comes back as basically her bodyguard, Gail Hawthorne, uh, Liam Hunksworth. Uh, and they go to District 8 where Katniss is filmed kind of being saluted by dozens of, like, wounded civilians at a hospital. So, like, she wants to to kind of convince her to be the Mockingjay. They let her see what happened to District 12. This kind of ignites her to want to be the Mockingjay. So they send her to District 8, which has recently been in a battle with the Capitol. She goes into a hospital there, and there's a bunch of you know, wounded civilians and soldiers, and they kind of rally around her and uh, kind of sparks, again, some of the, the propaganda that they use with her, the, the Mockingjay. So Snow sees the footage, and what does old Snow do, Todd? He decides to bomb that place. Yeah, he orders an airstrike at the hospital, basically killing everyone inside of it as a Katniss and uh, the rest of the team is kind of evacuated a little bit before that. So the crew, they film Katniss and Gail shooting down, you know, the two capital hovercrafts. Katniss is kind of rage-filled threat. You know, if, if we burn, you burn with us. You know, that kind of thing. She cuts a mean promo. She man. does. She does. <laughs> she does. Um, so afterwards, we see uh, kind of, I think it's District 7. They start revolting against the capital. And then uh, Katniss and her team end up traveling back to District 12 to kind of film uh, some more of the destruction. And we get her singing uh, The Hanging Tree. Uh, apparently, behind the scenes stuff here, Jennifer Lawrence, she did her own singing for The Hanging Tree. Uh, the song actually went to number one on the iTunes sales chart. Wow. Okay. Apparently, she doesn't like singing, though, and hated filming The Hanging Tree scene. But she's pretty good at it. I got to give her that. Yeah, I thought she had a pretty decent voice. Uh, so, Todd, take us through the attack on the dam. Uh, Peter's kind of warning to Katniss into District 13 and uh, the actual attack on District 13. So uh, Rebels in District 5 are kind of inspired by Katniss's song, and they're actually singing it as they march upon the dam in District 5. It provides the power to the Capitol. Uh, they actually manage to breach it, and uh, it throws the uh, Capitol in the darkness. Uh, right before this, Katniss is watching Flickerman interviewing PETA. Uh, <laughs> Did you kind of get a vibe from him, like in this one? He's more like a he's playing like a straight newsman. None of the big teeth, yeah. big hair. He's yeah. just like Ted Koppel. Yeah, actually, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot more like that. He's a lot more toned down here. It's basically his character, uh, very kind of heavily featured in the first two films. Yeah. Here, he's kind of more of a kind of like, basically a cameo. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's a lot more. You know, once the war stops, starts raging, it is a lot more kind of wartime correspondent, kind of just really downplaying. Yeah. It's not about the pageantry and all the. <laughs> I'm rich, you're rich. <laughs> He's like, uh, tell me how uh, how big of a bitch is your old ex girlfriend? Peter? <laughs> exactly. Why is she doing this? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Though, no, I, I understand exactly what you mean. <laughs> so, uh, BT actually manages to hack into that broadcast when Flickerman is interviewing Peter, and they're trying to counteract with a Katniss clip of their own yeah. kind of out propaganda and then propaganda. Uh, Peter actually has a moment of clarity, and uh, he actually just trying to warn him that, hey, Snow's getting ready to bomb y'all's place. You know, <laughs> get the fuck out. Get the fuck out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Take yeah, shelter. Exactly. And you kind of see Peter in that interview. He looks kind of like, he looks worn over. He looks like he's been tortured, malnourished. Uh, I was wondering how they did that, actually, like if he just, you know, died and, like, you know, lost weight. But apparently they actually uh, use CGI to kind of slim his face down for uh, some of those scenes or whatever. They give him the Captain America uh, First Avenger treatment, ah. I guess, basically. So they basically have, uh, even though they're already underground, they have further underground shelters. Yeah, bunker, right. The bunker they go right. into to kind of, uh, you know, hang out till the bombing is over. Uh, 
once it's over, they kind of go up to the surface. Uh, Katniss does with a few of the others, and she realizes, or we see that the entire ground is just like littered with those white roses. Yeah. And she knows from this that, you know, Snow is behind this, and she's she's going to just, or he's just going to keep torturing PETA and attacking PETA just to get to her. Yeah. He loves his white roses, boy. Man, he went through a lot of them in this yeah, flick. Exactly. <laughs> Good thing he had that whole greenhouse. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, coin, she sends out, um, her, her special forces team, which is basically, uh, kind of the, the, to, they, they sent out to rescue PETA and some of the remaining victors, uh, cause you still got Joanna in Abaria and Annie that are still kind of imprisoned in the capital besides PETA. So she sends out, uh, the kind of special forces team, which is like Boggs and like, uh, Gale and some others mm-hmm. to kind of go rescue them. Uh, we see that BD he hacks into the defense system and he he uh, basically they start airing a propo kind of live a Fennec who's like kind of narrating. They tell him to go out there and just don't stop talking. And he don't. <laughs> yeah, he definitely does it. Uh, so uh, you know he and he's and, and some of that stuff was you know kind of good backstory and, and world building. He kind of goes out there and says he you know, reveals that Snow would kind of force them to be desirable like tributes to be like in prostitution basically to kind of sell their body if they were, you know, fit and desirable and like, you know, if they didn't, they were, he would kind of threaten to kill their families and all this kind of stuff if they refused. And I think it's kind of hinted at that's what happened with Joanna as well. So a lot of kind of good little backstory and a little bit of world building that you get in that little propo that, that Fennec is doing. Yeah. Um, and also he kind of reveals that uh, we kind of get set up and he, uh, through him, that Snow is kind of known for poisoning his enemies which is something that he sets up. And then we also see in another scene with uh, kind of, I guess, uh, like a council meeting with like, uh, I don't know if it's General Antonius or something like that. Yeah. He ends up poisoning one of his own right. generals who's uh, not very good at his job, apparently. Uh, but when that propo is not enough, we see uh, Katniss. She wants to kind of, she's like, you know, let me talk to him. Like, you know, let me kind of distract him. So they set Katniss up to kind of talk directly to Snow to kind of buy time for Gail and everyone to find PETA and the rest of the, the tributes to kind of get them out. Uh, so Gail, they kind of rescue the the captors. They get out of the, the capital pretty easily. And they're like, this is, this is a little too easy. It's a little too easy. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, it seems like the capital kind of reduced its security on purpose and kind of let them escape with PETA. So uh, why, do, why do you think Addy is tied? So t- tell us what happens when they get PETA back to District 13. <laughs> so after uh, they get the uh, the tributes that was in tra- captured in the capital back, uh, Katniss actually goes to welcome PETA back, and she is attacked by him. Just He just jumps all over, about chokes her to is death. Is PETA going to have to choke a bitch? <laughs> he does. Yeah. Almost kills her. Yeah. Uh, uh, Boggs actually has to knock him unconscious, and they secure him in a you know kind of a room to himself. Actually, strap him down, I think. And uh, when she finally wakes up from the attack by Peter, uh, she gets informed that he's been hijacked or brainwashed by the Capitol and uh, to eliminate her. You know, he's now it's been so indoctrinated into him that Katniss is the enemy. This has all happened because of Katniss, Katniss, Katniss. Yeah. You know, she's soon, a Capitol mutt and yeah, all that kind of stuff. It's like as soon as he sees her, he's just ready to kill her. Yeah, apparently he was, um, you know, he was in solitary confinement, and they uh, they used that um, they they call it hijacking, but they used that uh, tracker jacker venom. Right. Some of the other, like we saw those in the the very first Hunger Games where Katniss gets stung by them, they use some of that to kind of help this hijacking and brainwashing. But yeah, he just goes right in there and just starts. It's not a warm reunion. He just chokes her out basically. Mm-hmm. She wakes up. She's got all those bruises on her neck. She can barely talk. Yeah. I thought that was really good stuff. It actually, was. it was. But I mean, at that point, that's that's the film, that's yeah. the whole thing. I mean, from where we pretty much learned that Coin is planning to put into motion this plan to take the primary military stronghold, which is in District Two. Yeah, and we learned that a lot of people there are still loyal to the capital. Well, I mean, basically, that's it. Yeah, I mean, this is that's again uh, the big the big point to hammer home here is this this to split these films into two was a mistake. This was just wheel spinning. It was just padding out, I think, a film that didn't need to be a two hours. It should have been 30 minutes added on to Mockingjay. What is Mockingjay Part 2, basically? Because there's just not a lot here. And what you do get is not very memorable, and it doesn't really drive home the story much. It doesn't really move things forward to me. But what were your initial thoughts after watching uh, Mockingjay Part 1? Uh, you know, uh, from, uh, 
going from catching fire to this, uh, it was kind of a, you know, it was a little bit of a letdown mm-hmm. because you see her at the end of uh, catching fire. She's found out her district's been destroyed. And, uh, you know, you get that close up of her face and she's just like, she's raged. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, I'm ready for her to go in there and just, you know, take that bow and arrow and fuck stuff up <laughs> in that Capitol board. Right. And then you get to this and it's kind of like propaganda, anti propaganda. You know, you think about it, there's very few action set pieces at all in this movie. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing I was thinking about, like, afterwards. Like, I kind of, from a story perspective, I appreciate that it's not just her storming the Capitol and, like, leading armies and stuff. Because I think that's the easy way. But I think what you're saying also is valid because, like, she ends up, she does end up kind of taking initiative and going to the capitals. We'll see in, in part two, but like the propaganda stuff, like it's, it's what, if this was realistically happening, like in the world and in the story, it makes sense is that that's how they would use her because she's not a soldier. Right. She's not, she's a kid that has some skills and is good hunter and is good with a bow that managed to live through two Hunger Games with a lot of intervention from a lot of people. But she's not a soldier. She's not, you know, in the military. She's not going to be out there leading people down the streets of the Capitol. But, like, I think that's a good element to the story. But like you're saying, it's too much. This whole film is about the propaganda and making and filming all these propos and stuff. And it's just too much because it's it's boring. If you just showed right. that, if you just kind of cut out most of this movie and just started with – the Mock and Jay opening with, you know, setting up what happened in District 12, showing that, her starting to do the propos, and then we move into basically Mock and Jay Part 2. That's all you need. True. You just need the setup for it. You don't need to see all this back and forth because you know what the stakes are already. You know what's happening. Like, that's that should be a little bit more of the focus away from the propaganda and some more of those scenes of what's happening around like all the other districts that would have helped a little bit more about setting the scene, maybe a little bit, a couple bigger battle scenes. They don't have to be prolonged, but just show some battles happening across the districts and then go into what's happening in mock and J part two. It's just too much of propaganda and like how that's working and all of it. It just doesn't add much into a film right. in book form. It's probably great in the novels. It probably works, but it's just for two to split this into two films. doesn't work. Right. I mean, is there any scene that you would consider memorable from this time? Uh, I actually had a couple. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I thought that scene where she actually gave that impassioned speech after that hospital attack, because if you remember earlier, they were trying to do like a canned promo with her, like, you know, in the bunker. Yeah. Like Join arti- now. Yeah, like an artificial background. And I'm doing my part. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, and Hamish is like, no, 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 no. This is not Katniss. You know, you got to get her out there. And, you know, you see it after that cap uh, attacks that hospital. She's like, you know, she lays into him with that pro. She cuts a mean promo, as yeah. we mentioned earlier. Yeah, she make it, she do well in the rest of the, yeah. you know, the wrestling world. Uh, that scene of the aftermath of the bombing where that, the entire area is just littered with those white roses. And then Peter's attack on Katniss. You know, as I say, I, I had kind of forgot a lot about this series. I hadn't watched it in a while. I forgot he jumped on her like that. I was like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think Peter one. I think you know. I think yeah. I, I think the 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 first good promo and like her her kind of uh, rage after she sees what Snow does to to the district. I think that's a good one. I think the one I had to take away is probably the 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 Peter strangulation stuff. Yeah. Like that's probably <laughs> that's probably the most memorable to me. But there's not a whole lot else. There's not a lot yeah. of meat on the bones in this film. No. Like you get a little bit more of back and forth. You get a little bit more of the development of the relationship between Katniss and Gail. But you kind of see their relationship is kind of built on. He makes a comment at one point. I think I think it's in this film, isn't it? Where uh, something's happened with him, and he's kind of uh, he's like sad about it or something. And she kind of kisses him, and he's like, you know, you only pay attention to me when you know I'm in pain or something like that. Is it that? Is it, I think it was. This I think one, it's yeah. this film. I, I might be wrong, one. but at this at one point they start to blend together because yeah. they're very similar, at, especially at the start of both films. But like you kind of see a little bit more development of their relationship in that. Uh, you know, obviously her feelings about Peter change um, once he's kind of hijacked and he tries to choke her to death. But like you also see her relationship with Gail is starting to change, and he's taking more of a role 
in the military side of things. He's right. taking on more responsibility uh, and moving higher and higher in rank inside of uh, basically the the new rebellion, basically. Uh, we already kind of talked about, did they need to split this film into two parts? No. No, no Absol- absolutely not. not. No. Absolutely not. Uh, so, so some notes I had here. So this film was dedicated to Philip Seymour Hoffman. He, he died a week before filming ended. Uh, since the majority of his scenes for the final two movies had already been filmed, the role was finished with other characters taking on his lines, which we'll see in the second film. Uh, according to Liam Hemsworth, uh, Jennifer Lawrence would purposely eat foods with garlic or tuna before any kissing scenes between them. <laughs> Jennifer. Uh, at around 12 minutes, do you remember there's a scene where she's uh, wandering through District 12 and you see that dog for a second? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So apparently that's Donald Sutherland's dog, Biggles. I'll be damned. Yeah. Uh, and Jodie Foster was considered for the role of Alma Coyne, which went to Julianne Moore. Both had played Clarice Starling in the Hannibal Lecter film franchise. How about that? Just something I thought was interesting. And this is also my final note here. This is the first film not to include a kiss between Katniss and Peeta. Mm, okay. Just a kiss of death. <laughs> uh, Around that neck. Exactly. So let's uh, let's get into our review score. So we rank films on a 1 to 10 scale. Starting from 1, the ranks are Torture, 2, Awful, 3, Bad, 4, Subpar, 5, Mediocre, 6, Decent, 7, Good, 8, Great, 9, Amazing, 10, Masterpiece. So, Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for The Hunger Games, Mockingjay, Part 1. Uh, my rating for this movie is stepping back from the grade I gave uh, Catching Fire. Uh, I still think this is a 7. I still think this is a good movie. Uh, I agree with your points that we didn't necessarily need this to be like Katniss going in like an 80s action movie star, just decimating the capital with her bow and arrow. Right. It was just it was too slow of a burn. You mm-hmm. know, it could have just been added on to uh, part two and just had this be a one one shot deal. Mm-hmm. But I still think you know all the acting, everything in this series and especially in this movie has been you know really up to par, if not above par. And I still enjoyed it. A little bit of a slow burn, but I still enjoyed it. Okay, so you're at a seven. Seven, which is good. Okay. So for me, I really enjoyed the first two films. I was genuinely excited to see where the story was heading. Uh, a lot of that excitement went away after watching Mock and Jay Part 1, I would say. Uh, I think it was a mistake to, to split the films in two parts, as we mentioned. Why did they do it, Todd? Money. 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 <laughs> double the films, double the money, baby. Right. That's, that's just the way it works. I, I don't think it was a case... Um, you know, I don't. I don't think you can make the case that you know splitting this film was for story purposes. I just don't think you can make that case. Right. I think it was just to to kind of prolong it, give us two movies instead of one, double the box office, double the returns, that kind of thing. You could have condensed this film down to thirty minutes, released it with part two as a three hour film, and you'd been just fine. Exactly. Because as I said, this was wheel spinning the movie. Uh, it did very little to get me excited about the conclusion of the story. It's not a bad film. It's just boring. So I gave uh, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 a 6 out of 10, which ranks it as decent. All right, Todd, Mockingjay Part 2. So what is going on at the start of Mockingjay Part 2? So we've got Katniss. Uh, she's recovered from her injuries at the hands of Peta's attack. Uh, she gets sent by President Coyne to join the forces in District 2 in kind of an effort to rally the troops and to kind of garner support away from District 2, uh, they have capital loyalists there. She's trying to kind of win their hearts away uh, as, you know, kind of the squads and battle plans are getting in motion for an actual assault on the capital. Uh, we see Katniss actually sneak on board one of those ships to join the final battle. Yeah, Joanna kind of covers for her while, yeah. uh, you know, Joanna's also, uh, they do rescue all the tributes that were uh, in Monk J Part 1. They do end up rescuing all the tributes out of uh, – the uh, the tribute center in the uh, in part one, Joanna is one, and she has a couple of good scenes with uh, with Katniss, but she does end up kind of covering for her while she kind of sneaks on board the helicopter while it's making its way to the capital. Um, so we get Katniss; she is recruited into what is called the Star Squad. Um, so that's Squad Four Five One. Uh, they're all given uh, Nightlock pills, which is an interesting little thing that kind of we'll come back to later on. They're given Nightlock pills, which are basically suicide pills, cyanide right. pills. Nightlock, we see them in the very first Hunger Games. That's what her and Petey were considering taking 
together to kill both of themselves so that they would screw over the Capitals' plan to only have one winner of the Hunger Games, to have no winner. But they're all issued night lock peels. But uh, for Squad 415, the Star Squad, um, we still have Boggs. He's the commander, basically. We have a second in command, uh, in command Jackson. Uh, Soldiers Holmes, Mitchell, and then we have the League Twins. League One and League Two. They're basically <laughs> blonde. Uh, two blonde twin uh, females. And then we have Finnick, Katniss, Gale. Uh, PETA eventually joins uh, the group, which uh, kind of leads to some speculation that maybe things aren't on the up and up with uh, Coin, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Uh, we still have her film crew, Cressida, Masala, Castor, and uh, Pollux. So under the leadership of Boggs, uh, the squad makes its way to the Capitol. Uh, so basically throughout the Capitol, uh, they have kind of pulled everyone back and like kind of instituted, I guess, like a curfew and like a you know shelter in place kind of thing. And the Capitol has rigged pods, what they call pods, all around the Capitol. And so these are like different. Basically, they've used their game makers from the Hunger Games to like think up traps and things to spring on anybody from the rebellion that would be coming through. And they placed them on street corners in the middle of the town squares, just anywhere and everywhere. I don't remember if they say how many, but there's hundreds, maybe even right. thousand of them. So basically to counteract that the rebellion has these things that are called hollows and it allows them to like, they have data that basically it's not complete. There could be new ones if they're added, but basically they're working on a map or a blueprint of these are the pods that we know of and this hollow will kind of show where they're at as they kind of walk through the Capitol and say, basically it's the, uh, like the, uh, the gun from aliens where you can like see the radar. Like it's uh, basically kind of works like that in a way, if you think right? about it, but basically you see a holographic map of the pods around the Capitol. Uh, so they're kind of working their way through the Capitol and then old Boggsy gets Lieutenant Dand. And gets yeah. his legs blown off, uh, basically. So they're moving through. He ends up triggering a pod that I guess they didn't know about. He's mortally wounded. Uh, basically, you don't really, you kind of see it flash by really quickly, but you basically see, like, his legs kind of got blown to pieces. Uh, and so as he's dying, he kind of tells Katniss, you know, not to trust. I don't know if he says specifically not to trust, trust Coin. Or, or what, but he's, I know he says, you know, kill Pete if you have to. Right. But basically he entrusts her with the hollow because it's kind of coded to whoever's supposed to be using it. So he transfers uh, command of the hollow or, or security of the hollow over to Katniss. And uh, he kind of warns her about kind of Coin's ulterior motives, that he, he doesn't really trust her, she shouldn't trust her kind of either. So that kind of sets that up for what we'll see a little bit wait, uh, later. Right. Uh, and then we get uh, the group, they kind of get pinned in to this, like, town center, the square in the middle of town, by this kind of wave of tar coming through. At first, I was like, okay, is it tar? Is it oil? It seems like, based on what I was reading, it's like kind of a tar-like substance. And then you see PETA, they've kind of, like, cuffed him the whole time. Like, he's kind of been, like, you know, they have someone kind of watching him and got him through the city the whole time. And you see him uh, kind of like have a little psychotic break and kind of snap back for a second and be like, oh, yeah, I'm here to kill Katniss. And then like pushes, I think it's Mitchell, I think yeah. is the character that's listed, pushes him into that tar as it's coming through them. But it's also, I, I was at first I'm like, is it, this, is it two traps in one or is it one trap? Because like you see Mitchell get like, uh, caught up in this like net or chains of like razor wire. I'm like, at, at first, did you think it was one trap or two? It kind of looked like two traps, like a dual trap. Yeah, I think what happens is like the tar comes in, but I think when Peter pushes him, he just happens to like push him onto another trap of that like chains and razor wire or whatever. Right. But he basically gets filleted and hung up in the middle of the town square, and the rest of them kind of retreat into a building and try to go upstairs to kind of keep the tar from. Uh, you know, going over the top of them. So basically they get to the top of the building and the tar kind of recedes eventually down. Um, but through that, I think one of the um, the twins is injured. I think her leg gets right, injured yeah. by something. And so they decide that she's going to stay behind. So the two league sisters end up kind of staying behind uh, as well there. But they get trapped and they're kind of getting descended upon by the peacekeepers and – uh I'll let you kind of pick it up from there, Todd. So the peacekeepers actually destroy that building, and uh, 
they don't realize that they, they've got out. The squad's actually made it out into another building. And then you start seeing, like, Hunger Games style, like the Capitol starts announcing their deaths. And, you know, yeah. we see Katniss roll by. And then uh, Coin actually hijacks that broadcast. And she starts doing, like, a eulogy-type remembrance speech to kind of rally the troops and to, you know, get more support. And then the group actually gets out of that building and they decide to move into the sewers, you know, like they got to get off the, you know, get off the ground. They go right. underground. Works for a little while, but uh, Snow actually finds out they're still alive and they're down there, and he manages to send down these uh, genetically altered mutts to kind of finish them off. Yeah, so these are like, they're uh, they're kind of like human-like. They're like human kind of lizardish hybrids. They got like pale kind of white skin. Um, we've seen mutts before the first Hunger Games. Obviously, the Tracker Jackers are a form of mutts, uh, and those, I think they're called, uh, let me see here, they're called... Wolf mutts. Those are the ones that are also the kind of vicious dog looking, pit bull looking ones that we right. see that they let into the arena as one. But these are the ones, these mutts are down in the sewers. Uh, and f that scene I thought was really good. Like it's it's kind of like I've I've heard other people compare it to like aliens. I was going to mention that. Did you yeah. get an aliens vibe? From yeah, that? it was definitely <laughs> you kind of got an aliens kind of sort of vibe to it. For but I thought that scene was, was pretty well done. It was uh, probably the only, I mean. It's not the only action scene, but it's probably the best. It was probably the, the biggest one yet. Yeah, the, it was probably the best action scene, I would say, that we kind of get in the film. Um, and we see that uh, we kind of lose a lot of people. Uh, the biggest kind of uh, death that we get there is Finnick. Yeah, Finnick. He's yeah, gone. R.I.P. Finnick. Yeah. Uh, and he, he was reunited with Annie for a bit. They actually, in a scene uh, prior, him and Annie actually had gotten married. Uh, he was kind of, in both films, he was kind of relegated way to the background. It seems like he was having a hard time adjusting to what happened after the Hunger Games. Right. Like the 75th one. But he was really kind of put in the background of these films, which kind of sucks in a way because I really liked his character. But, yeah, he ends up getting done in by the mutts in the sewer. So, yeah. R.I.P. Finnick. Uh, so the survivors, they go, they take refuge. Uh, I think it's Cressida who's like, I know somewhere we can go. I know somebody can help. So they end up taking refuge in a house owned by Tigress. Right. Uh, a former Hunger Games stylist and apparently Snow's cousin, I understand. That's cool. Uh, I don't know about you, Todd, but this the Tigress scene, this, her look and all of it in general just felt completely out of place in the universe of the film like wh what did you think here i agree i mean because so far in the entire series everybody else was pretty much they looked human they were yeah. maybe outlandishly dressed and you know and their actions and mannerisms but they were human and right she kind of looked like a human creature hybrid yeah apparently she's had some kind of cosmetic surgeries to like I mean, I guess apparently beauty in the capital is a big thing, and she's had some type of cosmetic surgeries, and for what I understand, like maybe took it too far, right. and then she was kind of shunned by the capital for having kind of one too many operations. I don't know how you go from improving yourself as a human all the way to having too many surgeries to make you look like a cat. <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, uh, apparently the uh, like those altering surgeries and stuff, they're like they're given more. Uh, kind of emphasis and stuff in the books than we see in the film. But okay. given that, I just just make her normal. Yeah, if, if you hadn't introduced a lot of it in the movie already, I mean, why do it right now at the end? Yeah, and if you're not going to kind of explain it, like have a little scene where her and Katniss sitting down and be like, why the fuck you look like a tiger? Yeah. like <laughs> It's like human, 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 tiger person all of a sudden. Yeah, if you're just going to spring it on us and then not explain it, or like I said, have a little scene where she's – Katniss goes up out of the basement or something and like talks to her. Yeah, or and be like, we why? Get a little why your face like that? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? How rude, Katniss! I know, right? But like, ask her, like, you know, and like, figure out her backstory when she tells us, like, you know, her beauty in the capital is the paramount, and I used to be the most beautiful woman in the world. And exactly. Now yeah. I'm a kitty cat, and you know, like, <laughs> whoa. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? What Hunger Games are you watching? Uh, I think I was watching something else. Um, but, uh, yeah, it just, I don't know, it just felt a little off to me. But uh, anyway, Todd, continue uh, on with our story here. So uh, we see a broadcast from Snow. Uh, he's actually inviting the remaining capital citizens to gather at his mansion. 
which of course, you know, get like a human lives bar, you know, a human barrier between him and the uh, oncoming rebels. Yeah, basically like a human shield built yeah. around his mansion. Y'all come on down to my place, <laughs> you know. Let's get this big shield between me and the battle. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because you know that the rebels have actually finally arrived in the capital. Uh, we see Katniss and Gale. They kind of try to, you know, blend into the masses heading towards the mansion. Uh, of course, their idea is to get inside and put an end to snow. Mm-hmm. Uh, Katniss actually gets a glimpse of Prim, her sister. She's there working as a medical tech, kind of helping aid. Yeah. Uh, then we notice a hovercraft kind of passing overhead, and it, it appears to drop what looks like those aid parachutes, kind of like we see in the first Hunger Games. From the sponsors, yeah. yeah. You can definitely see the Capitol insignias, mm-hmm. and you can hear the crowd like, oh, it's the Capitol, it's the Capitol. And uh, it's not aid, it is bombs, and they start going off, and unfortunately Prim is caught in one of the blasts, she's killed, uh, and we get to see Katniss become the girl on fire literally one last time, <laughs> Yeah, she is blown backwards, and part of her clothing is aflame. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you see the bombs drop, uh, Prim is no more, again, R.I.P., Prim, Katniss mm-hmm. gets knocked out. We see her wake up, and uh, basically with Hamish telling her, you know, the Rebels won the war, but, again, at, at what cost here? Um, kind of for the ending here, she uh, she goes to confront Snow. Uh, we see uh, he kind of tells her he's, he's out in his greenhouse full of uh, roses. White, yeah, white roses that he loves so much, and uh, he tells her that Coin staged the bombing to turn – the last few followers and peacekeepers he had against him. Uh, she doesn't believe him, and he reminds her of, like, you know, Katniss, I thought we said we'd never lie to each other. Yeah. You know, and so she kind of realizes that they sows that seed of doubt in her mind that maybe it wasn't the 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 capital that did those bombings. That maybe it was coin after all. Uh, and then what really kind of triggers her is a scene earlier in this film where we had Gail talking to BD about how to how to get into the Capitol and uh, bust a nut. I mean, uh, <laughs> crack the nut is, right. what, is what they call it. Okay. No, that's what they call it. So cracking the nut. Basically, the plan was you you trigger an event or set off a bomb here that drives uh, your enemy or whoever else to another point for a and then you get them with the second bomb. They think they're safe. Right. And then you hit them with the second bomb. So you drive them with the first one where you want them and then really get them with the second bomb. Okay. And they called it cracking the nut of the capital or gotcha. busting the nut of the capital. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so she kind of she's kind of sitting there stewing and she kind of realizes that Gail suggested a similar plan to what the the, the capital, quote unquote, used. And uh, we kind of see Gail come in and he kind of acknowledges it, you know, that, it, you know, it was his plan, but, you know, did he really do it? So that, that, that's my kind of question. Like in, in Katniss's mind, she blames Gail for Prim's death. Do, do you blame Gail for Prim's death, Todd? I mean, it, he may not have actually dropped the bombs himself, but, you know, I, I think, you know, he, he was in on it. You know, he. You know, he had the idea, you know, you say early in the film, talking about cracking the nut. Uh, either way, this piece of our love triangle is out of here. <laughs> yeah, one way or another, right or wrong. I, I don't know. To me, I mean, he, yeah, I mean, he suggested the plan, but then they're in a war. True. And he could have never thought that it would have been used against, that coin would have used it against the cap, uh, used it against the capital in that way True. to like kill survivors, and obviously never never thought it would kill Prim. So like, I don't know. It just seems a little bit unfair. Like just because You're, I was yeah. just because I would come up with a plan to like that I was going to use against the capital. I didn't mean for it to be used in that way. I never thought. Our people would use it on innocent civilians. I right. thought it would be used against peacekeepers or co- or uh, Snow's people. So I don't know. I think it's a little bit unfair. Apparently, from what I was reading, though, uh, maybe in the books it's a little bit more clear. Maybe, maybe it's maybe it's more black and white and more gray in the film and, and black and white in the in the book because apparently Gale's a lot more bloodthirsty in the okay. books than he is here. But again, we have to go by what we're seeing in the film. I don't I think it's a little unfair, but ultimately, to your point, ain't no love triangle no more. He gone. Yeah, he gone. 
Uh, so uh, before this, though, were, were you personally rooting for Katniss to end up with Gail and Hunksworth or PETA? Uh, for me, it was always PETA. Okay. I mean, all the shit they went through and, you know, all the stuff they had to endure, uh, I mean, you got to ship, you know, Katniss and PETA. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, so Coyne, she's now the interim president, and she refuses to hold the kind of promised Democratic election uh, that she was touting, and she suggests to the little kind of council of uh, surviving tributes that to what they should do right now in lieu of an election is to have a symbolic Hunger Games and use the Capitol's children as basically the tributes and as revenge. And so she puts it to the vote and uh, some of the tributes, uh, PETA, he is outraged. He says no. Um, let's see, I think Joanna, she's in there. She's in. Hamish vote. Well, Katniss has the basically the deciding vote. And Kat Katniss says if she gets to kill Snow, then she's okay with it. And then that causes Hamish to kind of look at her and like, mm, all yeah. right. And Hamish kind of votes yes to the the Capital Children Hunger Games as well. Yeah, I mean that scene at that table, uh, Katniss to me, I mean she looks like she's just emotionally she is checked out. Mm -hmm. She's gone. She has been through so much shit in this movie series, and she's just like. Yeah, as long as I get to get snow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, like, you're still left wondering, is she sincere in that? Is she is she secretly planning something? Does she right. think it's coin? Or does she really just, at this point, I don't care, snow has been, you know, he's been such a pain in my ass, <laughs> and he's done so much to everyone and to my family and to me. You still left warning. Maybe she just wants to kill Snow and be done with it and walk away. So you're right. still kind of left with a little bit of mystery there. But they uh, they prepare Snow's execution. They have him out in the big like courtyard square thing where they do the the chariot introductions in the earlier Hunger Games film. That yeah. like they come down that uh, that long stretch and they have kind of Snow at the end of it. Coin gets up. She does her you know speech to the got to go bring joy to the masses. <laughs> like her her. <laughs> Her, her speech, <laughs> Batman Returns reference there for anybody. That you got to warn it. me when you're going to go Max Shrek on yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, but she goes down and she uh, she does her speech. And uh, we kind of see her, you know, Katniss. She's in her, uh, her Mockingjay outfit. She's completely made up in the persona of the Mockingjay. Uh, we see Snow is uh, is uh, kind of uh, tied to like a post in the middle right below Coin. Coin is up above. Mm -hmm. Katniss pulls out the arrow, draws down the arrow at Snow. But what happens, Todd? She aims that baby straight up and puts it right through the center of Coin, baby. Right through, right <laughs> through Coin. I thought it was a really, really good scene. It was. I really didn't think that's where this film was going. I mean, like, I know it's set up, but like when I was back in – like Catching Fire or the beginning of Mockingjay Part 1. I didn't. I never thought this would be the ending of the film, would be with Coin being the ultimate villain. Was right. I, maybe was I naive? Did you see it coming? Like early films? I actually, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, I never thought we'd get there. And I really like the kind of matter-of-fact way that Coin just gets shot, just drops. And I really love the, like, just the look on Snow's face where he's just laughing he's maniacally. He's just cackling his ass And, off. I mean, obviously he's got some kind of, you know, disease where he's, like, you know, he coughs and been coughing up blood in other films. And you just see that mouth full of blood and he's just laughing his yeah. ass off. And then the, the gathering crowd, they just go and they just, as a as a mass, you know, as a mob, just tear him to pieces, basically. It's you crazy. don't see it, but you know what's happening. Yeah. Uh, so, Todd, from there, uh, well, one other thing to mention, too, uh, right after Katniss tries to, after she shoots Coin, she tries, she puts, she's put the nightlock peel into her kind of her chest plate. She tries to take the nightlock peel, but Peta kind of knocks it out of her hand and says no, and then we see Katniss is, uh, is arrested, basically. Uh, so take us through the uh, the end of the Mockingjay Part 2 here, Todd. Uh, so, as you say, uh, Katniss is being held for her actions, Uh Hamish actually comes to visit her. Uh, he brings her a note from uh, Plutarch. Uh, she really don't want to read it, so he yeah. reads it to her. And uh, basically, uh, Plutarch is thanking her once again for being the right choice to do this deed, uh, to, you know, kind of bear this burden and set everyone free. And for now, at least, uh, until everything else, you know, shakes out, uh, you know, to bring, you know, kind of peace back to, uh, you know, the, the land and... Uh, 
He kind of mentions also, too, that you know, once everything shakes out and we get an elected president, she's going to be officially pardoned for this. And then uh, he leads, they, his, his message leads to say, I think it's a, a Paler, Commander Paler, that we see before. Right, right. She's the front runner, basically, to be, be president. We do see that a little bit later. And uh, so uh, basically he's made arrangements for her to be able to return home to District 12. Uh, we see her go back to District 12, but she's still kind of suffering from pretty much everything plus the loss of her sister. Uh, eventually we do see that PETA has showed up. He's back in the District 12 as well. Uh, he's almost completely back from his brainwashing. You know, he's pretty much back to his old self. Uh, you know, we flash forward a few years, and we see uh, Pete and Katniss together at the end, and they got a couple of kids. Yeah, and she's kind of sitting there holding one of the – Pete is kind of off playing with one of the older children, uh, one of the, the older child that they have, and she's kind of sitting there kind of watching them uh, as they play and kind of talking to the, the infant that she's holding in her arms about. Basically, she kind of wonders if, you know, the child will ever kind of – if they'll – the the child will hear the story and know the story of her time in the Hunger Games, basically. Right. Um, still a very bittersweet ending overall, I would say. The kind of the the toll of war, if you will, pretty right. much. Right. Um, so uh, here here's a question though, Todd. Agree or disagree? Uh, the film should have ended without the time jump and Katniss and Peeta being married with children. Shouldn't have ended that way. Agree or disagree? I actually like the time jump. I tell you, if, if for one reason I like that little scene where she's holding the baby and it kind of wakes up and she's like, oh, did you have a nightmare? And she's like, you know, mommy has, you know, paraphrasing here. Not, right. You know, mommy has nightmares too. Uh, you know, it's a constant battle. But, you know, I got this little game I play with myself where I try to think all the good little things that's happened in my life. And, you know, she says there's worse games to play. Right. Of course, you know. I liked it. I thought it was pretty cool. Right. I mean, I can't. I can't say you're wrong. I just like, I don't know, for me, just the way this film is, and it is kind of about, it's about power and the corruption of power. It's about war and, and sacrifice and the toll that war takes. Like, I kind of wish, like, I get you want to have a happy ending. And I, I don't know how the book ends. I don't know if it's exactly the same or not. But for mm -hmm. me, I think you just had a, a really good way to end it just before that when they're just kind of still kind of just around the house and kind of getting to know each other again and they have that little moment where they're just kind of sitting in like the open door while it's raining right and they're kind of looking out and then she's kind of looking at him and you kind of know it kind of leaves the future ambiguous you think they're going to be okay and everything like i just think that would be a little bit better ending to me i think I to end that point end on that note other than to go into this it's like super happy. We're all in a meadow. Like got we you. got our happy ending. Like again, you know, happy endings are fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, uh, but um, it's it just felt like to me it was it was a better moment just to kind of like leave it a little bit ambiguous and say yeah. what does the future hold? Pete us here now. We're together. Like we're living here. Maybe we can make things work. What's life going to be from here on out? And just kind of, it's still a little bit hopeful, but it's still not completely like, here's our happy ending. Like, let's spell it out for you. Kind of. I got thing. you. I can see that. Point. I can't. I can't. I don't hate it at all, but I think you just had a little bit better moment for the tone of this film to kind of bring it back a little bit and kind of leave it there. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Um, but what were your initial thoughts after watching uh, Mockingjay Part Two? Uh, definitely a step up from part one. Yeah. Uh, you know, as we mentioned back when we first started uh, talking about this uh, series, I had watched these all back in the day. Had been so long and my mind's getting so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot a lot that happened in these movies. Uh, I'm glad I watched them, uh, particularly this part two. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some, some notes I had here. Um, so, uh, you kind of mentioned before, so there's a scene where, uh, Hamish kind of comes in and reads, uh, Plutarch's letter to Katniss. So that was originally scripted to, to be Plutarch himself and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, he was supposed to talk to her in person, but unfortunately Hoffman had, uh, died before the scene was filmed. The water in the sewer scenes was mixed with caramel coloring, uh, Dawn dish soap and alfalfa to give it a frothy, substantial sewer water feel. Okay. I just put that in because it had the word frothy. <laughs> uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's final film, it was released the year after his death. 
Um, I think this film is missing him a little bit more. I would like to see him, like, his character was really good, and, and like, you, you really got a lot of, uh, see a lot of him in Mockingjay Part 1 with the propos and all that stuff. So right. this was definitely missing, um, you know, some more of his character, with, you know, which, you know, is understandable because of what happened, of course. Like, you can't do anything about that. But it was definitely missing, like, that character from this film. Like, I would have loved, loved to have seen that scene at the end between him and Katniss. Like, it would have it would have been the way it should should have, you know, should have went and right. obviously does in the in the book, but you know, circumstances being as they were. Uh the I found this interesting. The consoles in District 13 Control Center, uh the set, they were originally built for the Mission Control Center set in Apollo 13 and were later acquired by a prop rental house and rented out for this movie. Several of those same consoles, still with the badges reading Panem and Property of Capital District Defense Forces, were used in the Mercury Control Center set of Hidden Figures in 2016. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, those uh, those uh, those rentals and the, those props, those consoles, have made their rounds. It does sound from like uh, it. 95's Apollo 13 to this movie to Hidden Figures. Okay. Uh, Katniss Everdeen's red outfit on the movie poster never appears in the movie. I, yeah. Again, I'd never seen this part, and I, I always figured she donned that red outfit at some point because I always seen it in the posters, but yeah. we never see it in the film. Never saw it. Uh, Squad four one five is a uh, or four five one, I should say, is a reference to uh, four five one or four hundred fifty one degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature at which paper burns. Since Katniss is the girl on fire, it's also a call out to Fahrenheit four fifty one, a dystopian novel by American writer Ray Bradbury. And the last little note I had here, uh, and it follows with a question, considered by director Francis Lawrence as the most violent Hunger Games film out of the four, would you agree with that? Is it the most violent out of all four? Uh, I think probably maybe outside of that, the first one where they had that initial bloodbath at like the start of those games, it's, it probably would be. I, yeah. think, I think that would be my, my most violent. I think I would say the first one is the most violent yeah. just for that opening little bloodbath. The bloodbath <laughs> at the cornucopia, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, this is number two, I guess. So, Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2. My final score for uh, Part 2, I go back up to an 8. I thought this movie was great. Uh, Sometimes when you get to the end of, like, these series, be it a trilogy, or which is what this one should have been, but, you Mm -hmm. know, I digress. Uh, A four-parter, you know, sometimes you have a hard time sticking the landing. I, I think this movie did a good job sticking the landing. Uh, from beginning to end, I thought this was a great series. You know, it had its low points, uh, but I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad we went back and revisited this. I had a good time watching all these again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so for me, Mock and Jay Part 2, it delivers a solid but slightly disappointing ending to the Hunger Games series. The story of the girl on fire started as a wildfire, but kind of ended as a campfire. Uh, I give The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 a 7 out of 10, which ranks it as good. Uh, We'll actually be covering a little bit more from The Hunger Games universe as I believe it's next week we have The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. We'll be covering that for the pod as well. So we wanted to kind of revisit these first four before we watch the uh, the President Snow prequel film, I guess. Are they pies and snakes? <laughs> pies and pies and snakes. <laughs> uh, so, Todd, tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. Uh, we are at Tal Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tal Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at talcapespod at gmail.com. Also, if your show obliged, leaving us a five-star review on your podcast app of choice really helps the show. Uh, Popcorn Mumbles will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. May the odds ever be in your favor, guys.